Good evening. Thank you all for coming out tonight. My name is Jack Riggs. I am the writer in residence at Georgia Perimeter College. I'm a little bit further downtown than this. We're uh, located on the Clarkston campus uh, within the Writers Institute. Uh, but I'm here tonight to introduce Terry Kay and to welcome you all here to the Social Circle Theater. I'd like to thank uh, the Standards family and the Social Circle Theater for having this. We hope that this is going to be uh, a type of event we're going to do on a regular basis out in this, this here neck of the woods. We really enjoy being out here. We're so happy that Georgia Perimeter College uh, has built a campus here, and we look forward to it growing for years and years to come, uh, and this event growing as well. Uh, I would like to thank the Social Circle Theater for uh, hosting us, and of course the GPC Foundation and uh, our campus out here, uh, the Newton campus out here, to being in this vicinity, to serving the, the um, constituency, and to providing these kind of uh, events like this. So thank you all. Thank you for coming out on this not-so-certain weather night we're going to be into. I'm not sure how it is that we measure a writer's life. It is a lonely occupation, one that demands we sit by ourselves for hours on end in front of a pad of paper, a typewriter, and these days a computer, and go somewhere else, another dimension perhaps, certainly into another world where characters walk up to us, introduce themselves, and allow us to tell their stories. It is a great responsibility to first listen and then get it right, translate the imagination into concrete reality, to tell the story that is being given to us, a gift that comes from somewhere else. I can't tell you where that someplace is, but I know it out, it's out there because I have now done it twice. I have had the rare opportunity to be chosen to tell story. Terry Kay has done this for a very long time. He has become a trusted writer that characters regularly appear to and offer themselves up. I think they know Terry will take care of them, take care of their stories, that he will embrace and uplift them, listen and then get it right on the paper, that he will breathe life into them so when their stories are told, we as readers will understand it as truth. The measure of a writer comes, I think, in the authenticity of the work, the success of bringing characters and geography to life in a way we believe it. We say, that could really happen. Or better yet, I remember that place like it was yesterday. That was my time, my place. Listen to Fred Chappell as he writes about Terry's previous novel, The Valley of Light. I know these people, he says, rough cast, good-hearted. Terry has got down the way they talk and think. He has felt what they feel. This can only be possible when a writer loves his characters. Well, I would add to that that this ability to translate, to record the lives of characters, can only be accomplished when the character loves the writer. I have come to understand this fact a little over the past few years that I've been writing. Terry Kay, I imagine, he's understood it for a very long time. Terry has published novels since 1976, when he first wrote The Year the Lights Came On. As he continued writing, he has become known as a writer of versatility, able to switch genre and voice with ease and command. Here in 2007, he is still at it with a wonderful book recognized widely as perhaps his best, The Book of Marie. Listen to what some are saying about this or extraordinary new offering. St. John Flynn, host of Georgia Public Broadcasting's Cover to Cover, says this, this is a major event in Georgia letters, as Terry Kay is arguably Georgia's greatest living writer. Jackie Cooper from Fridays with Jackie, Georgia Public Broadcasting says, the Book of Marie is the novel Terry Kay was created to write. With all of his success in the past, this book is the ultimate K story. It is a book about the South and a cataclysmic event of integration, as well as a love story that spans decades. 
being part history and part romance, the book involves us in a way few stories can. It is told with an eye for the truth and could only be written by a son of the South such as Terry Kay. Now, it is important to note here that Terry, Terry Kay has visited with us at GPC before and, in fact, was the Writer, in, Writers Institute's first visiting writer in residence back in 2004. A lot's happened since those intervening years. We have seen each other at various book gatherings, spoken briefly as we both rushed to and from signings. I have taken counsel with Terry several times since he was last here, valuable counsel, one who is always ready to help, always ready to give himself to others. I have benefited from this, and I am appreciative of Terry's time and energy. I am a better writer today because of what he has given. The Writers Institute was lucky to have Terry present at our inaugural Visitor Writer in Residence program, and I think GPC is fortunate that he can help lead this new campus into a great beginning. It is a great day here in Social Circle, an evening with Terry Kay. I'm excited, and I hope you are too. So many good things to come. In the end, all I can really tell you is this. The man can write. The great gift is his, and he has made good use of it over the years. Thank you, Terry, for being with us today. We, honor, we are all honored that you have come. Now, please, let's give a good social circle welcome to Mr. Terry Kay. Thank you for coming out on this uh, evening when South Florida is playing Rutgers. Uh, I, I think that's who it is. Um, I am really delighted to be here. I like doing, I like doing this. I, I especially love hearing the introductions. <laughs> I just, it's so, it's so amazing to me. I wish my family could hear it, <laughs> especially my sisters and brothers. And I'm from a huge family. I'm the 11th of 12 children. I have seven older sisters. Um, my two living older brothers are both distinguished members of the clergy. Uh, I should say my seven sisters, and, and now, sadly, they're... they're uh, only three are still living, but uh, I, I think of them as still alive and as my seven sisters. And perfect sisters. Perfect. <laughs> I, I promise you, perfect. I am the one member of the family who was basically considered worthless <laughs> growing up. I really was. I was. Were you also considered worthless? Seven. S seven? Oh, you're kidding. Oh, dear God, child. Have you been in counseling yet? No, I'm right. But you will be, I promise you, after a while. And I always start these, these occasions by telling a story about my sisters. Some of you may have heard this particular story I'm going to tell. I do this to pay them back. I mean, they're not around, and I know that, but it makes me feel better if I can talk about them a little bit. In the little community where I grew up in Vanna, which is over in Hard County, not too far from here, we all attended a, a, the Methodist church there. Was, in fact, it was the only church in the community. Uh, so we attended the Methodist church. And there was many, many, many years ago when I, I probably even before I was born, um, there was a minister in the, in the church who had this peculiar habit. It was a circuit church, you know, he was there one Sunday of month and then to another church. You know how that works. And, uh, but this minister had the peculiar habit of calling on two members of the congregation to do the morning um, prayer. Uh, it wasn't uncommon for the minister to call on a member of the congregation. Well, he wasn't in the community and he didn't know all the ailments and things. And you know, if you call on somebody that lived there, you were more likely to get all of that covered. But he called on two members, and I'm not sure why, unless it 
He didn't trust one to remember everything. And so the other. But one day he made the horrible mistake of calling upon two of my sisters to deliver the morning prayer. Now, they, they were not accustomed to doing this. They just weren't accustomed to praying in public, even standing up in public, being recognized in public. They weren't. But they knew they had to do it because it would be expected of them from our family that if called upon, you were supposed to try, at least try, right? So they stood up, my sister Jean and my sister Nell. And the preacher said, Jean, you start it. Nell, you, you finish it. And they stood up, knees knocking, uh, trembling. And Sister Jean said, Dear God, take over, Nell. <laughs> and to show you I did not come from a family of idiots, my sister Nell said, Amen. I will not be quite as brief tonight, but I also promise you I won't be as profound. Uh, but anyway, I have to tell these stories about my, about my sisters because my sisters, my sisters have influenced me in one thing. I have a tremendous respect for women. And it was because of my sisters, I'm sure. They, they, threatened me and I, I said, but I have a, I have a great and I did not know this really until a few months ago when somebody was talking to me about my books and they said you know Terry one of the things that you do and you've done in every book you have a very powerful woman character well, I never thought about it I just these were characters and they said so we started reviewing the books and 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 uh, and who the characters were and why they were strong that sort of thing, uh, and they were right. I I, I do have whether well, they're powerful. I, that's up to the reader. I don't know. Uh, I have a, a a woman character that will be sort of dominant. In this book, the book of Marie, it is properly titled because it really is the book of Marie. Marie is a young girl who appears from Washington, D.C. in 1954 at the beginning of the school year in Overton High School in Northeast Georgia, a, a town and a school that had great resemblance to Royston, Georgia, which is my hometown. And, and uh, there's her reputation, a little rumor has, has preceded her that this new girl would be there and she's very bright and she's very brassy and, 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 and uh, aggressive, etc. Um, and the first day of class, she encounters the uh, the Overton High School football team, uh, of which uh, the the young quarterback Cole based a great deal on on me. And I will tell you, this is true. I was as heroic as Cole was. And actually, Cole's more heroic than I was. But when you write, you always make yourself heroic. Learn that. Always make yourself heroic. Forget the rest of them, but make yourself look good. Anyway, um, she encounters them, and immediately everybody in that school knows no one is a match for this girl. No one is. The first day, she overwhelms the school. The teachers, the principal, everybody in it, all the students, and they're terrified of her. And they're, they, they will have, you know, they're just really scared of this girl. So they start talking about her. What do we do? Here's this Yankee, this girl from the north, and da-da-da-da-da. Well, she, she asked Cole, after a few weeks of, of, of school, to come to her house one day. And he, he goes for whatever reason. Uh, and when, when she, he gets there, she tries to encourage him to help her teach some young black children who are holding a class in her garage. Uh, these are the children of the lady who is the maid for, for her family, right? So it's just stunning news, stunning that a white girl in 1954 would do something like this. So it becomes, it becomes sort of the irritant that, that will carry on throughout the entire book, all right? Cole doesn't know how to handle this. 
He doesn't know how to handle them because he's never been confronted with anything like this. As all of us, we face the same thing during that period of time. My age, you face the same thing. It was it. Uh, however, they become friends. They become friends because members of the football team dare him to date her. And he does. They pay him $30, all this sort of stuff to date the girl. But they become like, it, it, it's like a, a, a couple of, of, of uh, actors. And they, they make this decision. We're going to play this melodrama, this role during the period of time that we are here our senior year. So they pretend they're sweethearts and they're going steady and da 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 da. And they play this role. And the, the, and the high school, the entire school is a, is a gullible audience for him because they're the two brightest people in the school. She is smarter than he. She, she becomes a valedictorian and he is the salutatorian. Right? Uh, so they play this role. And at the end of the school year, she delivers the speech, and in the speech is a burning prophecy about what is happening, the changes that are going to be taking place in the world. And they do take place. Everything she predicts is stuff that we all know in studying the Civil Rights Movement took place. Okay, And she tells him he is going to become very famous. Very famous. Well, he becomes famous later because he is at a demonstration in 1962 at a college in Atlanta. And he goes down, he doesn't even know what's going on, but he sort of works himself into the crowd of demonstrators, and they're young whites and young black uh, uh, students there, kids. And across is a group of men who are rough looking. And he's standing behind these two girls, and a guy lifts a gun and he shoots, and he hits the girl in front of him in the, in the back. She falls into him and he catches her. And this, a, a, a photographer who's there to cover it turns and he snaps a picture. And when he snaps the picture, it be, wins a Pulitzer Prize because blood is, is, is flowing up from her, you know, it's covering his face. It's one of those incredible, rare photographs to describe a scene, etc. And in his hometown, that taints him because everybody thinks. He is an agitator. And that was a thing that was powerful in that period of time, in the 50s. It's whether or not you were with us or against us. It was a horrible, horrible experience for many young people to go through, white as well as black. It was horrible. But it was real. It was absolutely real. He goes through an experience where they burn the house of the maid who had the children because they want to get back at him. His picture holding this black girl is all over the world. And that's, you know, <coughs> this is their reaction to it. So he has become famous. He has to leave his, his, his area and he goes to Vermont to become a teacher. Main part of the story is he's returning for his 50th high school reunion. And he's going, to, he's going to face all those things that there are ghosts in his past, right? Well, during this period of time, he has, he has kept up a correspondence with, with uh, Marie. They agree never to see one another. They agree never to have pictures sent. They agree to remember each other as they are. They had the junior-senior prom picture and, and as, as they, as they uh, were while they were in high school. But they do correspond. I'm telling you all this because I want to set this up. And I want to teach you. Who else wants to be a writer here? Right. Who else are the writers? Uh, right. Writers, writers. I'm going to teach you something about writing that you will not get in a classroom. And I want you to listen to me. And you classroom teachers, you listen to me. Because this works. You know, they tell you in classrooms, any classroom teachers do this, I'm so sorry if it offends you. I don't mean to offend you, but I can promise you I know this one. <laughs> All right? We are taught to keep a journal. Quit doing that. Quit keeping journals. All you're doing is learning how to write to yourself. Here's what you need to do. Take the same thing you're going to put in a journal and write a letter to somebody. You will find 
You'll learn how to write if you do that. All right? And here's what's invaluable about it. The reason I'm telling you that is because of what I'm going to read from this book. I'm going to read you nothing but the letters of Marie to, to Cole. And I want, when you listen to this, I want you to imagine who this girl is and see if you know somebody like this girl. The lesson for writing is that you can describe a person better through their dialogue, or in this case, letters, than you can through narrative. And you always can. It always works better than if you sit down and describe them wholly in, 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 in a narrative. A real trick, if you're writing a book, and you have these principal characters, and you have these minor characters, never describe your principal characters in any detail at all. But describe your minor characters in great detail. And the reason is this. You want your principal characters to be sensed, not seen. You want your minor characters to be seen, not sensed. It works better that way. Now, trust me on it. <laughs> trust me on it. I got a lot of words that, that, uh, that, that to me, prove it. Of course, I'm up here doing all the talking and, you know, the... The other teachers who could, could uh, debate me on this have to, have to sit there and say nothing. I like that. <laughs> Dear Cole, you may now address me as Dr. Kick, uh, Kilpatrick. Uh, Fitz. What's wrong with me? I don't even know her name. Fitzpatrick. I am, after all these years, a legitimate sawbones, as they used to say in the Old West. I am pleased to announce to you that I will be... Uh, moving to Columbus, Ohio to begin practice. Why Columbus? God, I don't know. They made a pitch for me and it sounded so earnest, so pleading that I had a momentary meltdown of good sense and agreed to become goddess of the scapel among Ohioans. If you had asked me three months ago where I wanted to live, it would have been in any state in the nation other than Ohio. I would even have chosen Georgia for crying out loud, and you know how I despise Georgia. Maybe I need whatever humbling I'm certain to encounter, and that should make you happy. You've always been unbearably rude about my God-given superiority. Maybe in Columbus I'll meet another cold bishop, and after the lobotomy I perform on him, he will play the same role in my life that you have played, being the irritant that forms the pearl in my soul. But he will be mute. I'll see to that. And maybe I'll stay only a couple of weeks. Maybe I'll go to work one morning and someone will say something so sugary sweet. I'll throw up, turn in my stethoscope and strike out for parts unknown. Maybe I'll even wind up in that miserable little Vermont town you're in. No, I wouldn't do that. I'd have the unhappy accident of bumping into you in a food market. Isn't it strange, Cole, that we've never visited in all these years? Why is that, other than our agreement, I, I mean? Are we so afraid of one another? Oh, God, I'm beginning to feel sentimental. That tiny, uncontrollable part of me, the one I would exercise in a heartbeat if I could, misses you. I wanted you to be here to celebrate with me. Excuse me. I think I'm going to stop writing now and go into my bedroom and close the door and throw myself across the bed and cry you out of my system. It's what I get for revealing myself. Never reveal yourself, Cole. Never. You may discover who you are. I hate you. <laughs> Dear Mr. Bishop, let me review the letter I received from you today. You say you have become engaged at the age of 37 to a woman named Holly, described by you as being pretty, lively, intelligent, and most important, patient. You want my blessing out of friendship for this glorious event in your life. Are you an idiot? You want my blessing to marry someone with a ridiculous name of Holly? I can see her now. She looks exactly like Barbie. And she's just as dumb regardless of your fawning description of her spectacular intellect. How many years will it take for you to realize that I am the only woman, and yes, damn it, I am a woman, who could possibly enhance your miserable life? Here's what's in store for you, big boy. You will amble along year after year, bending to Holly's inane blithering, until you become nothing more than an echo of who you used to be or could become. 
And then, surprise, surprise, she will kick your highly educated but sorry ass out, your, out the door and run away with some street bum packing muscle and wearing a face like Burt Reynolds. Just do me a favor. Don't ever mention her name again unless it's to tell me you're divorced. My God, Cole, when will you ever learn anything about women? Don't you understand there's always danger behind slow blinking eyes and puckered lips? Do you not know the, co the cooing sound a woman makes in her throat is as lethal as poison? No, no you don't. You live by a code that makes you want to be a gentleman and innocent. What you don't understand is how vulnerable that makes you. Holy God in heaven, sweet Mary, mother of Jesus, I feel sorry for you. I wish I had never known you. You should be here. This is the first letter, by the way, she writes him. You should be here, my naive, mendacious friend. I'd like to hide behind trees and in doorways to watch you wandering around. You'd look lost and you would be. There are things here that your feeble mind could never comprehend because you're a hick and you'll always be a hick. <laughs> How you'll ever become famous, I have no idea. And if I didn't believe in fate, I'd, I'd never believe it could happen. God, I miss you. There's not a fool in this city as gullible or as grand as you. As to the photograph, I hope you choose to keep it and occasionally take the time to look at it. We were both beautiful that night, but I want us to make an agreement. Never send photographs to one another. Even better, never call me, never send me a telegram or a, messenger, uh, or a message by carrier pigeon. If you choose to communicate with me, I want it to be by letter. When I think of you, as I often do against my better instincts, I want to open my photo album and remember you from that night, and I want to read your letters and listen to your voice rise up out of your words. If we do have a friendship, let it be that, Cole, a friendship of words, not pictures. That way we'll never age, will we? We can be one of those happy ever after couples you dream about in that Dixie Crystal sugar sweet world you want to live in. And yes, I know you may not want the enclosed few pages, a copy of my graduation speech, but I wanted you to have them. Destroy them if you wish. However, if you do, first read them. Read them carefully without prejudice. I have never felt as sure about anything as I do about those words. Change, Cole, change. It's rolling over us. Don't let it crush you. Cole, and this was the one letter I will tell you. This is the one letter. Out of, I love writing these letters. This is the one that when I wrote it, I wrote it very fast. And when I finished writing it, I did not know until I finished that I was crying. And tears were just rolling down my face. That doesn't happen very often. Uh, Lord, I get too bored by my own writing to cry. But in this particular case, it did. You know, Cold. I write with sadness in my soul. My father died last week. Ironically, I was at home on a visit, the first I've taken with my parents in three years. He was standing in the doorway, about to go outside to give my car one of his fatherly inspections. His body folded and he fell. It was like watching the implosion of a large, magnificent building being raised for some god-awful new thing. And metaphorically, that is what happened. Some hidden charge of dynamite with a slow, burning fuse of age ignited and exploded in his heart. I tried to save him. I did everything I knew, but nothing worked. I never talked about loving him, did I? But I did, Cole. I loved him beyond the words I might have used to describe it, regardless of how sweet they would have sounded. Do you remember when I wore his dress shirts to school and on our first so-called date? It wasn't a rebellious fashion statement. It was because I was so frightened of being where I was that I needed him with me. And here's a confession. The shirts I wore were never clean. They were always taken from the clothes hamper on the day after he had worn them. When I left Overton for Boston, I took two of his unwashed shirts with me. I never wore them, but I often went to my closet and touched them. Is it strange to believe a person's presence stays in or on the clothing they wear? My mother is at the point of collapse, and I am worried about her. I had no idea she was as devoted to my father as she was 
And then I do not mean that in a callous way. I knew she loved him. I simply did not know he was the core of her life. Watching her is like watching a one-legged amputee trying to stand for long periods of time. They can't do it, Cole, not for long. They need the missing leg for balance, for strength. I want her to move to Columbus to be with me, but she refuses to talk about it. She will not desert the town where his body is buried. Is there prosthesis for the soul, Cole? My mother needs one, as do I. Will you try to make one for each of us? Will you go to your workshop of words and take your alphabet tools and fashion something for us? We have not exchanged photographs, so you have no way of knowing my appearance. So I want you to remember me as you last saw me, the shape of my face, the color of my eyes, the length of my hair. And I want you to picture me sitting at my father's desk as I am writing this. Do you have that image, Cole? Can you see what I am wearing? His shirt. The shirt he was wearing when he fell like a magnificent building from an exploding heart. You are much in my thought. I would like to hold you tonight. No, I would like for you to hold me. Tumbo. Thank you. Cole, I dreamed this last night. We were in the corner cafe on prom night. You in that silly, funny, double-breasted suit, and I in my wedding gown of white silk, beautiful as I had promised you. And the waitress, her name was Frankie, or should have been, asked us what we wanted for dinner. You ordered, and I'm reading this, and I just had dinner at, uh, at the, up here, you know. <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, you ordered country fried steak, green beans, and mashed potatoes, a side salad with French dressing, iced tea, blackberry cobbler. I had a salad with vinegar dressing only. I didn't need the oil. There was enough oil in the air of the corner cafe to open a service station. <laughs> but I really wasn't hungry. I wanted to watch you eat. You were a pig, of course. What else could you be? You are a southerner. Country fried steak, green beans, mashed potatoes, and iced tea. Iced tea is a southerner's liqueur, I think. It's a wonder they don't use it in church for communion wine. <laughs> Iced tea for the blood of Jesus, cornbread for his body. <laughs> oh, Cole, I do agonize for you. Please leave. Be the runaway that is in your heart. Run away to me. I will hold you, hide you. There will be no pictures of you covered in blood. We will find a new name for you, something out of a book or from the obituary pages, a name used but not used up. I will introduce you as a cousin or a lover, your choice, my wish. You can pretend you are a writer and live in libraries. There are schools here which are wonderful. You could teach. I know you say you do not like to be cold, but the winters here are cold only if you think they are. The winters are beautiful. Nothing on earth makes you as aware of living as snow on your face or the steam of your breathing. You can see your soul in that steam. That is why I want to die here. I want my soul to leave my body in that puff of steam. But if you do not come to me, find yourself another place. Leave, Cole, leave. Do you know of bagels? They do not serve bagels in the corner cafe. I know. I called them this morning. I think Frankie answered. She said, what? I said, bagels. Do you have bagels? She laughed, and I am only supposing this, switched her gum from one side of her mouth to the other. She said, what's that? And I told her, it's like a donut, but not sweet. She had a great answer, Cole, a classic southern answer. Lord love a duck, no. We got biscuits. Find a place where you can order bagels as easily as you would order biscuits in the corner cafe. The poem you wrote to me is beautiful. I thought I could touch you when I read it, wanted to touch you. I wonder if you know what it means, or did you simply put down words that sounded right? I shared it with a professor, told him who had written it, showed him the picture of you and Etta Hensley. He raved over it, blithered on and on about the metaphor of a drowning man looking for water. I only listened. 
uh, if I had told him the truth that for you, the oasis of palm trees and cool blue springs is nothing but a fool's dream, he would have become huffy. Professors do not like the crystal of their wisdom shattered. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm among professors. <laughs> Make a fool of myself. Why not? Or am I wrong, Cole? Do you really understand what you have written? Is your throat dry, your tongue swollen? Can you feel the sand cutting into your belly? I do love you. In a good way, I do. In the best of ways. And this last. Dear Cole, last night I attended a lecture by a woman with the arrogant name of Ebony Naismith, a change from Sissy Williams. She's a black woman from Louisiana, and because of her name and because of my cynical nature, I half suspected a comedy routine by someone who works strip joints for spending money. But I was wrong. She's a smart lady, Cole. She has her doctorate in philosophy, and it's more than a piece of paper to her. She has spirit of fire raging in her soul. She may be the only person I've ever met that I would gladly swap lives with, given the chance. You know what she talked about, Cole? She talked about Tennessee Williams' play, The Glass Menagerie. And of course, I thought of my mother and of you. Do you remember how you used to scold me for making fun of my mother's love of the theater? The truth is, I was a little envious of her, I suppose. And I do remember being in awe of her when I saw her perform the role of Amanda in that play. I was very young, maybe 12, but I never forgot it. It's a magical play, really. A little dated now, but still magical. Of all the lines in that play, it was Tom's closing monologue that got to me. Tom calling out to the memory of his sister, Laura, saying, Blow out your candles, Laura, for nowadays the world is lit by lightning. You had no reason to know it, but that was the line that inspired the speech I made at our graduation, the speech that embarrassed you and my parents and surely made me an enemy of the people. And that was what Ebony Naismith talked about, that line. If she had been a real pulpit seminary trained preacher, it would have been her scripture selection. Isn't that strange, Cole? Isn't it? Her message, wake up, people. The world's lit by lightning. I think that line was written for you, Cole Bishop. I look at the photograph of you holding Etta Hemsley, and I can almost see the sky behind you streaked with lightning. Do you know how that makes me feel? It makes me want to be with you again. Back then, I mean, back when we were the talk of the town, the main players in that sorry little melodrama of our youth, back before the lightning came flashing out of nowhere. Blow out your candles, Cole, for nowadays... Well, you know, don't you? You've been struck by it. So anyway, I wanted you to have those. Jack Riggs, Jack Riggs knows what a rare thing is for me to do. Is I don't like reading. I, I, my stuff, I mean, I really don't. Um, it, it, it always feels awkward. But I, I, I will never do what... Did any of you ever see James, James Dickey read? Do you have any of you? Yes. Dickie had this thing he did. <laughs> he was <laughs> reading his poems, you know, and he would, he would and always in the same poem, in the same poem, Dickie would pause and he would look at this, the puzzled expression on his face, reach into his pocket, pull out his pen, and he said, that line shouldn't be that. It ought to be in. He would write. <laughs> he did it every time. Same poem. <laughs> I don't do that. I don't do that. But I did want to, to, to share some of this with you because I so much enjoyed the writing of the letters. And I do believe I didn't know this girl well until I wrote the letters. And in writing the letters, it's what I meant by saying that you can describe a person better in dialogue or, in this case, this becomes the dialogue, the letters, than you could if you wrote them in narrative. So all of you who, who, who you know, aspire to write, that's just a little, little thing there to keep in mind. I want, I, I, I want to invite questions because I'd much rather respond to questions than read anything that I've ever written. So, but I can't see everybody, so if, you, if you're back there and you want to ask a question, 
Hey, uh huh. This is my father. The dance with the white dogs about my mother and father's death. Yeah, yeah. It's a strange thing. Uh, Jack rightly said that a lot of people are, are now, I mean, he know all my work, now believe this is my best book. I, I, don't, I don't know. I know that the dance with the white dog is the one that will always be the signature book. Uh, and, and it was a very hard thing getting over that, knowing that you have written your signature book. Now, everything you write after this is going to be something different. Uh, but, it, but it was, that was a very special experience for me, writing that book. Mainly because the only way I can think of that particular book, and it's personal, it's the death of your parents, it's a personal thing. The way I think of it is, I didn't write a book as, a, as much as I translated one. I translated something that I had watched and experienced and listened to uh, and, and I, when I wrote it, I really didn't even intend it to be published. I, I wrote it thinking that, you know, if anybody wants to publish it, fine, but mainly I was just going to Xerox copies and give to my siblings and say, here, this is what I, my expression of it, my feeling toward my, you know, our parent and, and what the experience of their life and their death meant to me. So um, I, I sent it to my agent. And, and he, again, just as a lark almost, I sent it to him and he says, call me and he said, this is absolutely beautiful, but I cannot sell this book in New York. And I said, you're kidding me, why not? He said, it's just, it goes against the grain of publishing. They won't publish it. He said, I'm going to send it out, but I promise you they won't buy it. And he was right. Everybody in New York turned it down. Uh, and then uh, Peachtree Publishing in Atlanta, they read it and immediately you know, send a taxi out with a contract. Uh, the only real joy I've had in publishing, dealing with the publishing industry, which is ungodly hard. All of you who want to write, you just forget it. You know, it's awful, awful. Get a mean lawyer. But, uh, but honestly, uh, uh, the only joy I've had is having all those people who turn that book down, all those publishing companies say to me, Boy, we made a mistake. I love saying you did. Yes, you did. Yes, sir. <laughs> Please, you all got to have yes. What do you think about books that are primarily letters? Primarily letters, they don't work. Yeah, I, I know. For the most part, they don't. And I, I, I mean, I, I know some. That I've got a young friend who wrote a, a young friend, a friend of mine. She's almost my age, but this is her first book. Uh, Two or three years ago, wrote a book called called uh, you remember it? Yeah, it's called <laughs> called the the year the music changed about Elvis Presley. Letters between Elvis Presley and this young girl. I loved it. The writing was brilliant, and it and that book worked. Most of the time, they don't work, and most of the time, publishers won't even read them. Uh, agents won't look at them because they just they say they don't work. You've got to be You've got to be really good to pull that off. Mm -hmm. got to be really good to pull it off. Writing is an easy thing to do. You put one word behind another one. That's all you do. It's so easy to do. Now, writing well is difficult. <laughs> writing brilliantly is almost impossible. But the writing itself is pretty easy. Mm hmm In Shadow Song? That, that's such an odd story. Can I tell you the story behind Shadow Song? Please. This is, I, I have two stories about Shadow Song. The first one is how it came to be. It was the book after To Dance with the White Dog. Well, when I did To Dance with the White Dog, and I went through this period, I couldn't write. I, I, I mean, I, I, was, I was going crazy. I was in counseling. I mean, truly, it was a bad time. I was depressed more than I've ever been depressed. It was awful. Uh, my family was going crazy. Uh, my friends were going nuts. Well, my friend Pat Conroy, who's the person who got me into the writing of novels to begin with, he was living in San Francisco, and he knew that I was having problems because of my family and 
and uh, mutual friends. Well, he would call me once a week and say, how you doing, how you doing? And I'd say, oh, Pat, that's great. I'm, I'm so good to hear about Great. Are you writing? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm writing. It's, uh, the words are flying out of the thing so fast, I, you know, I'm, I'm getting brain lock. I'm writing so well. <laughs> well, this went on for, I don't know, a couple of months. And he called me one day when I was feeling particularly down. And I said, he said, how's the writing going? I said, Pat, I'm almost finished. It's wonderful. It's just going. Of course, I'm rare. It's going wonderful. And he paused and he said to me, why are you lying to me? <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? He said, you're not writing a word. Why are you lying to me? And I broke down and was crying. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can't write. I'm a cousin. He said, my background is theater. I love dramatic moments. I absolutely <laughs> love it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I said that, and he says, I said, I've got nothing to write. I've written it all. It's gone. He said, Terry, here's what you write. I got it for you. He, I said, what? He said, you remember over the years you've told us all the stories about when you worked in the Catskills? How you bored us to death with these things. We would sit and yawn and, and you know, and you just, you just bored us to death with them. He said, but you've never written a word about them. I said, that's true. I have not, Pat. He said, here's your story. Yes, uh, I said, because there's no story up there. All we did was work. We worked seven days a week, 15 hours a day. So there's no story. I made up most of that stuff. He said, well, here it is. Dumb, redneck, plowboy, hick. Ties his mules to a fence post. He walks to town and gets on a Greyhound bus. And he goes to the Cats Catskill Mountains of New York. And he gets off in a village because he's run out of money. And he gets a job as a busboy in a Jewish hotel, in a Jewish <laughs> resort. And there he meets a beautiful young Jewish girl who's a guest in the hotel. And they fall desperately in love. Well, I thought that the fool was trying to make me laugh. I, and I really thought he was just trying to perk up my spirits and make me laugh. And I did. I laughed. And I said, Pat, i got to tell you, that's the silliest storyline I've ever heard. I just think it's the funniest thing. And there was a pause. And he said, you didn't read The Prince of Tides, did you? <laughs> now, if you know The Prince of Tides, people, that's exactly what he did. Dumb, redneck football coach goes to New York to rescue his fragile sister, which, by the way, this whole thing is nothing but the glass menagerie that Conroy writes about. Uh, his fragile sister meets Lowenstein, Lowenstein, the beautiful Jewish psychiatrist, and falls in love with her. I thought, if he can do that cheap trick and get by with it, so can I. <laughs> so I got, in, I got on a plane, went back to the Catskills. I hadn't been there in 25 years, and just walked around. Well, uh, three stories about this. Here is a miracle. For you people on the right, for you people who read, it happens, it happens, it happens. Rarely, but it does happen. Especially if you're working on character-driven stuff as opposed to plot-driven. Now, I've only written one plot-driven novel. I enjoyed it, but I get intrigued by character-driven stuff, not plot. But here's what happened to me in New York. I had been over to a little museum. and walked, I mean, it was the size of this, you know, that thing on the stage, tiny. And I was looking, and there on the wall was a newspaper clipping about a, an old opera singer named Amelita Gallicurzi. And I had remembered from my years of working up there the story of Amelita Gallicurzi, uh, that she was a brilliant metropolitan star, and she would come and stay at a place called Salmonte she owned. And it, she would go out in the summertime and stand on the balcony and sing these arias. And the whole valley could hear her. They would stop and listen, and there was... It's just a romantic thing. So I left. I thought, you know, this she'll be good maybe to put in the story. And I left it. And I was walk, walking it down to my car, the only car in the village. It's places a ghost town now. I'm walking down there. And I'm walking down the sidewalk. And I saw an old Jewish man sitting on a bench, a, a, a stone bench on the side of the thing. And I knew every thing there was to know about him instantly. Everything. Everything. I knew his history. I knew what he'd done. I, I knew everything you could know about him instantly. And an epiphany. Epiphanies do happen, people.
They happen to you in everyday life. They happen to you when you write stories or when you dance or when you do any of those, when you paint or whatever it is you do. Epiphanies do happen, and it happened. Of course, there was no man sitting there. There was no bench. It was just one of those things that I knew. And when I knew that, I knew my book. And I went over, got in the car, drove back to the place I was staying, packed, got to the airport and came home and started writing. All right? Well, here's the other story about Shadow Song. Before it was published, Warner Brothers and a company called Lee Rich Production Company had uh, got together and they bought, or they wanted to buy the, the book. And so they went through, finally got my agent and everything. My agent made me hide because he knew that if they called me and offered me $500, I would take it. <laughs> writers are dumb, by the way. You got, writers are really dumb. So he knew it. And he was real mad, and he said, I'll call you back. And I said, okay, fine. And it, and it was really funny. He said, they had made this offer, and he had turned it down. I said, great. And, and then he said, by the way, don't you want to know what they offered? I said, Harvey, I write books. You do the business. No, I don't. If you want to tell me, that's fine with me. I don't care. He said they offered a half million dollars. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> I said, Harvey, oh, I know what I'm doing this weekend. I will be on an airplane in two hours coming to New York. I'm going to find you, and I'm going to kill you. <laughs> because nobody turns down a half million dollars for me when I don't have any money at all without asking me about it. He said, I did, and he hung up. You know? I, I can tell you over the weekend, I wouldn't even go in and in. He made it better. He made it better over the weekend. Thank God. Now, of course, I didn't make the money because I never made the movie. But here's what's funny. Part of the deal is I'm going to write the screenplay, right? So they fly me to California, and I get into this big boardroom with Warner Brothers on one side of the conference table and Lee Rich on the other. They start talking back and forth. They hate each other. It didn't take me any time to figure out that this movie would never be made because they hated each other. And then finally, after about 40 minutes of this, I said, Listen, guys, why don't you all let me go home and write the screenplay? And then you can fuss over how it's going to be done. Well, they agreed to do that. So I went, got in on the airplane, went, came back to Atlanta, and sat down and worked on the screenplay. And I write those things fast. Screenwriting, to me, it's real simple. It's just, you know, you don't have to do any narrative. You just dialogue. And it drives you crazy. But that's what it is. So I wrote it, and I sent it back to them. And I got this phone call. They were stunned that anybody who wrote novels could write a screenplay. But I had been doing screenwriting a lot more than I'd written novels at that time. So the girl says, the girl said, Terry, this is brilliant. <laughs> said, We're, nobody believes that you've done this. Nobody. We could start shooting this tomorrow. That's how good this is. However, we want to tweak it. <laughs> Put that word down, tweak. When they say tweak to you, right. go somewhere else. <laughs> Three tweakings later, they fired me. And, of course, they had to write. It was in the contract. And I said to him, I know you did. Can you tell me why are you firing me? Here was the, here was the answer. You don't understand the book. <laughs> That's what I said. I said, wait, I thought I wrote the book. They said, well, you've lost your perspective on it. <laughs> My adventure with Shadow Song has been, has been a great one. It really has been. And I didn't mean to dwell on that. But I love those stories. Anything? Anybody else? Yes. How does Cole's character evolve from confessing that he's a runaway? Until he can accept that oh, Until he can accept the fact that he's a runaway? I think we all are runaways. And, and, and I honestly, for, for, to some degree, I think we are. And, and in, in this particular case, he had a profound experience that influenced his running away. Uh, the experience of the murder of the girl, but even more so the experience of the 
of Marie and her prophecy and her friendship. And the, it's, it, the book turned into a love story. And I never knew it was a love story until I got almost to the end of it. And I thought, my Lord, this, they're in love with one another. I mean, they really are. But I didn't start out to make it that way. But I wanted him to make a final confession. And that was why I wrote that last letter. And this is a letter not from Marie people, but from Cole to Marie. Uh, and and, and I, I wanted him to say, I am that. But I also, there's a little bit of a lie in what I just said to this degree. I actually wrote that probably 20 years ago, that the nub of that letter was written 20 years ago. You see, in this book, this is the fifth version of this book. And I don't mean rewrite, I mean version, fifth version. Uh, sometimes you have to make a lot of compromises to get done what you want to do. I had trouble in New York because the New York publishing people does not, they didn't, they didn't like the fact that someone my age from the South was writing about civil rights. Their, their, their thought was it would have to be biased and I, I couldn't get across to them. All you got to do is read what I write. And you'll find out if, if there's bias or not in it. I don't think there's any at all. I think it's, it's some validity to it. But really, I had to complete his character, and his character was the final confession. That might be, uh-huh. Gary, I remember you telling me years ago about a time when you submitted a manuscript. Uh, correct me, my memory is wrong, but I think it was to your editor at Holden Mifflin. And he said, Terry, you can't use this. Smacks of literature. It's not literature, <laughs> but it's smacks of it. Uh, what did he mean by that? That might be some object Well, I, the only way I know how to explain, I think this was my second novel uh, called After Eli. Uh, they would never do a paperback version of After Eli. <clears throat> I couldn't understand it, and finally, to find somebody to say why, and they said, "Don't you remember the editors thought there was this was too literary?" And they said, "It's too well written to be a paperback book." I said, that's the craziest thing in the world. I, I think they made paperback out of Moby Dick. I don't know why they, they couldn't make one out of this little thing of mine. But, uh, yeah, it's, you get typed. I am not a genre writer. Uh, it's, believe me, my agent hates the fact that I'm not. I'd make a lot more money if I wrote mystery or if I wrote romance or you know, something. But I'm not a genre writer. I'm not because of this, because of the theater experience. I I have no experience in literature. I didn't study it at all hardly in school. Did a lot of reading on my own, but not, not taking courses in it. But theater I did all the time in college, and it really did influence me. That's why The Glass Menagerie is in this book. The Glass Menagerie is the, is the play that made me listen to language, and that, that really was the transforming experience as, uh, into being a writer more than anything else. But I'm not a genre writer. That hurts me. It hurts me uh, a lot. Uh, but I have been typed as being a literary writer. I've got manuscripts. I've got a manuscript at home that I love. Set in Ireland. It's a light little love story. You know, it's just wonderful. It's just good characters. But it's a light little love. My agent hates me. Because he wants to, you know, he said, why do you want to carry this? Nobody expects this out of you. I said, I don't care. I Put a pseudonym on it. doesn't matter to me at all. But he won't even do that. You get typed. Even if you're not a genre writer, you get typed. And I've been typed, sadly. I'd like to be known as a trashy commercial writer, my friend. <laughs> I'd love that. Yes. How does it feel to, to sit and watch a movie based on a book that you've written? Ah, 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 agony. Agony. The only way you can really think about the movie experience on, a, on one of your books is just keep this one phrase in mind, 401K. You say it over and over and over, 401K, 401K, 401K. Uh, I... I have seen To Dance with the White Dog, which I think they did a decent job with. I've seen it four times. I will never again see it. Nobody could force me to see this movie again. It's, 
it's not what I wrote. You know, they made they took it, this story and made a love story out of it, which is fine. And, you know, I understand why they did it. But I know I a love story. I mean, love is in it, but it's a story of the dignity of aging. And I think it could have been presented but another way. The Runaway, I reviewed movies for eight years for the Atlanta Journal. 300 movies a year for eight years. This was one of the five worst movies I've ever seen. <laughs> when I finished, and my wife would testify, that when I finished the movie, watching the movie, I got up and went into the bathroom and threw up. It was that bad. It was horrible. Horrible. The Valley of Light, probably the sensual story was closer to what I've written than, than either of the other two. It was all right. But you still say, why did they do that? You know, that's not in my book. I, 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 that, that's kind of crazy. What did they do that for? Uh, it, it's really a test. But you do, you do think you know your money. I, and I ought to be, people, I am grateful. Please don't get me wrong in this. I'm great. I am one of the only two writers in America that's had three movies, three books made into Hallmark movies, me and Ann Tyler. And, uh, and so I'm grateful for that. I really am. I would like for Warner Brothers to come back and do Shadow Song. That would be fun. <laughs> right, anybody? I know. Uh-huh. From I do. I get the name of characters from obituary column. And you're going to read them, and you read them saying, what's the novel here? It's a great exercise. I've got one, my, and I carry it with me everywhere. Unfortunately, it's in the car. It's about a guy who's a, a, a loving, honky-tonk playing, you know, <laughs> pool playing. It was the funniest thing I've ever read in my life. But when I read it, I thought, boy, I know this person. I really understand who he is. So I do, yeah. But, but Cole Bishop. Cole Bishop. Cole Bishop actually was taken. Cole Bishop was taken from um, a private. The Bishop part came from a private cemetery, not far from uh, Athens. All right. The Cole I did actually to honor a young man that I happened to have admired a long time ago who had some. Uh, uh, he had some problems, and and uh, I did that. He didn't. Even, he doesn't know it at all. But sometimes you do things. You just you don't have to share them. You just you do them for yourself, and it makes you feel good and that sort of thing. And in every book I have, every book with the exception of one, and that's a Christmas book because I couldn't put it in it. In every one of my books, there will be a character named Rachel. In every one of them. And some, she's the main, major character, and others, she's just a mention. But her name is in each one of them. The reason is because when I was growing up, there was a girl in my community, in my class, named Rachel, that I was always kidded about. Yeah, 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 that's your sweetheart. That kind of, and I hated her. I hated her, and I treated her miserably, miserably. And then I realized much later how wrong it was to treat her that way because I was being teased. That, in fact, she was a remarkable person. So, in honor of, of that and to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I use her name in every book. She doesn't know it. She may not like it, in fact, if she did. All right. Say, what time is it? Say, for the good Lord, I've gone so far along, and I'm sorry. Is there one more? All right. Oh, my God, a poet. This is awful. This is my first book. No, oh, okay. It's in honor of my goddaughter who was killed in a car accident. Mm. And it's called Lacey's Room. And um, I just wondered, and I'm using a lot of the real names. Okay. Should I not do that? And my next question would be, since I am self-published, what would be my next step? I'm having it. Agent. Yeah. Agent is your next step. That, that's what you can do. As far if I were if I were writing something that's going to be real sensitive, and I'm considering it as fiction, I would change the names. I would. I really would do that to change the name. I could use hers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just just remember this. You, as the writer, you're not important. What's important is the person you're writing about. The 
greatest compliment a writer can be paid is if two people are talking about his or her book and they rave about it and oh, blah, 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 blah. And one of them says, who, who was it that wrote that? And the other one says, you know, I don't remember. That's a compliment because it tells you the story is greater than the writer. And the biggest fault with young writers today is that they think they have something profound to say. I get this all the time. I have this in me. It's, it's boiling over. It's uh, tormenting me. It's, uh, it's living in my chest. You know what I tell them? They get so upset. I say, here's how you handle that. Go take two Alka-Seltzer and burp, and you will feel better, and the world of literature will be immensely better off. And I believe that is true. I honestly do. God love. Thank you for being. Thank you for being readers. Thank you for being readers. Because if we didn't have you being readers. Poor Jack would not have a job. And I'd hate to have to support the boy. I really would. God love. Thank you. Thank you.